Trails Collective, what's shaking? Ian here for the weekly rundown of the Northeast Trail Running World for the week ending October 29th, 2021. Hopefully you're all ready to get your Halloween on this weekend. Still out there hitting some fall crisp trails and otherwise doing pretty well. Uh, so this week we will bring you a piece that caught my attention uh, in the media or something for you to check out. Uh, a couple items on the Ultra Sign Up hot list or those events that may uh, be about to cap out in case you're interested. A couple FKTs from this uh, past week. And then an FKT paired with, uh, in the results section, a number of voices from events that ran this past week uh, in the hope that it gives you a bit uh, of exposure to maybe events that may not have been on your radar prior and just able to uh, spend some time hearing uh, how some events went for uh, other people. Basically just talk and trail. And then we will close out with some of the events on deck for this week. Uh, and I will probably do maybe a couple more rundowns in this year. Uh, and then I may take a uh, break on the rundowns for a couple months to work on some articles uh, over the winter. Uh, I've been wanting to work on some articles for a while under our featured articles section. And I just keep not having time during the week. And so I may uh, take this uh, rundown time to work on a few of those as opposed to the rundowns. And as things get a little bit quieter, uh, we'll I don't know, figure that out as I go here. Uh, all right. So, and thanks in advance to anybody who uh, is, well, watching this right now. Uh, like the, like the uh, video if it's useful or, or you find um, some worth in it. Uh, like the channel. And uh, very appreciative for anybody who takes the time to share this in your own feeds as well as in other groups that you may be a uh, part of. Uh, so, all right. Let's get into it. Uh, on... Uh, actually, in the media for the first one, uh, fastestknowntime.com uh, uh, released episode number 160. Uh, it is on Max King with the title, Does He Have the Widest Range of Any Runner Ever? <clears throat> Although Max is based in Bend, Oregon, where I used to live, uh, he's a friend. Uh, solid Northeast uh, connections. Uh, while I was at Ithaca College, uh, he was a few years back at Cornell. We were both steeplers. Um, I may have started hotter, but he ended a whole lot faster and a pretty incredible runner. Uh, good individual. His wife, Dory, also grew up just south of Ithaca uh, and uh, occasionally will uh, come back through. So uh, check that out. I'm looking forward to listening to the podcast as I'm traveling this weekend to a cross country to our conference championship, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, the women hopefully are feeling pretty good this week, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how they run this weekend. On the Ultra Sign Up Hot List, uh, one in Virginia, uh, Freight Train 50K, 100K, running December 11th in Farmville. It's 93% full. And then the other one, the huge one, <clears throat> and this is kind of, um, it should be what's hot every week, is anything Algonquin Ultra. So even if registrations aren't technically open right now, really, I mean, it's just a hot, hot, uh, not only RD. But series of events that said RD puts on. Uh, so Algonquin Ultras on the perpetu perpetual hot list, even if I don't announce them each week. So check those out. FKTs of the week in Maine, Liz Archibald, one hour, 18 minutes for the 6.5 mile Mount Agamenticus, three peaks, uh, gains over, or gains around 1200 feet with some nice ridgeline views. Uh, they do have a, an event up there uh, that uses this uh, circuit. I think it's the Big A 50K and it maybe has some smaller events in the mix as well. And Liz knocked 18 minutes off the prior mark from March of this year. New Hampshire, Sharon Noor, nine hours, uh, four minutes for the Fraconia Notch Loop. It's a beautiful beast that offers over 9,000 feet of elevation gain over 23 miles. Uh, it looks pretty amazing. And this is the opening women's unsupported mark. In PA, Jeff Craven, 42 minutes, 34 seconds for the 4.5 mile Springfield Trail. He took one minute or one and a half minutes off of Stephen Elan's time from October. In Vermont, Ben Feinson, uh, seven hours, 25 minutes for the Iron Cross configuration of the Camel's Hump. Uh, stated to be Vermont's wildest and most beautiful summit at f over 4,000 feet. And this is an opening men's uh, unsupported mark. So nice work, Ben. In West Virginia, Nicholas Curlin, three hours, 54 minutes for the 24 mile uh, North Fork Mountain Trail. 
uh, running the Spruce Knob Seneca Rocks uh, National Recreation Area. Nicholas's time is an opening unsupported men's mark. And in Maryland, uh, one that was on my radar, I think as of a year ago, uh, from a similar, uh, if not uh, the same uh, route, was the Assateague uh, Island Point to Point. Uh, and this is one that I just thought was really cool. Uh, time starts, I think, when you um, get in the boat and start off, so it's not just about running. And then it's just uh, running on the island or sands or whatever. It just looked uh, pretty cool. So I did reach out to uh, this one. was uh, set or reset by Richard Weishner and um, wasn't yet up on the fastest known time site, uh, so I couldn't look into, or I didn't look into the details there. But... Richard did follow up with a clip to uh, dig in a bit deeper and give us a view of the Assateague uh, FKT that was just set. Uh, so Richard, uh, take us into that. Good morning, Trail Collective Nation. My name is Richard Weishner, and I'm here to talk about the FKT I recently did for the Assateague Island. Um, I had been bugging Trent Swanson for about the past eight months to take on this FKT. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to it, so I needed his blessing uh, to get out there and take care of it. So we had to wait for Astique Island to open up because they had bird watching going on during a lot of the summer and fall time. So once that was uh, in the clear, we were able to move forward. So this uh, entails kayaking onto the island, which was taken care of by Gabe. Uh, he was kind enough to let me come down with my girlfriend Aaron and we stayed over at his spot and in the morning around 3.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, we left out and headed over to the uh, northernmost point of Astique via kayak. Um, it was about a 20 minute trip and then once we got onto the island, uh, he was nice enough to walk around with me, show me where I needed to start from and then he took the kayaks back. Uh, I started at five o'clock in the morning, and then from there, I had a 10 mile journey to the first aid station point where Aaron and Trent Swanson would be waiting for me. Uh, there they had aid set up, and it was just nice to see a friendly face. Uh, it was amazing run though, uh, on the beach, moonlit, stars were out, sun was rising. Um, you know, just uh, very fortunate to be out there witnessing Mother Nature doing her thing. So after that, uh, I headed out. I was there for about two minutes, headed out, and then met up with Nate and uh, his wife, Christy. So Nate was actually the current FKT holder at the time, and it was really awesome of him to come out and support me on uh, trying to take on his uh, really tough FKT time. So uh, he had originally set the time at six hours, 48 minutes, and that was uh, what I was, you know, I was shooting to, you know, beat that by a substantial mark. But as things would uh, unfold later, it took me a little bit longer than I thought. So I met up with them uh, at mile 22. At that point, the sun had come out. I was starting to, you know, feel the effects of uh, the sun coming off the water, beat me down a little bit. I'm much more of a 40 degree cold and, uh, overcast type of runner than being out in the sun. So it was definitely taking its toll on me. They had some warm food set up for me. Uh, and at this point, the 22 and, a mile, 22 and a half mile mark is also the state borderline. So that's um, for Maryland and Virginia. And once I got over there, from there, it's about a 15 mile journey. The uh, journey from there uh, was not great because the sand uh, was on a slope and the tide was coming in. So as the tide's coming in, it's pushing me farther up uh, onto uh, areas that aren't as runnable. Um, just a lot of kind of uh, sloshing through uh, thick sand and definitely took a toll on my <clears throat> quads. And by the time I got to the next aid station at mile 33, uh, I, was, I was feeling pretty beat up. Um, Aaron and Matt were there waiting for me. Uh, I tried my best to complain and tell them about all my aches and pains, that I was overheating, and they politely got me on my way, uh, allowed me to put some ice on the veins, cool myself down, which is odd for October, but I was feeling it. 
So once I got cooled down, I headed out with Matt. Uh, and then from there, it's about, about a four and a half mile trip to the uh, southernmost point of Assateague Island, Chincoteague. And Matt was uh, gracious enough to come out and do the pacing for me, which really helped because at that point I was roughly about five minutes uh, on track to uh, beat the current FKT. So with that, he was able to get me there. Uh, I beat the time by five minutes, so it was six hours and 43 minutes uh, is when I finished it. Uh, it was It's a gorgeous run if anybody ever wants to get out there and do it. Um, running on the sand sucks uh, considerably. I would much rather run 100 miles on the trail than do another 30 or 40 miles on the sand again. But, you know, coming off on the sunrise, uh, it was beautiful. And then also just the finish line, um, you know, it was, it was really gorgeous. So uh, if you want to do that, I can always give you the steps in terms of going out there to beat that time. So it's, it's a tough run, but I think it's very manageable for somebody to get out there and, and beat my time. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, and big thank you to everybody that came out to support. All right, here we are, all finished up, contemplating walking back, begging for a ride, see some Jeeps coming in. Hopefully they'll be going home soon. Thank you to everybody, Trent, Gabe, Christy, Nate, Matt, Aaron, anybody else? Joey. Joey, my brain's not working right. It's been a long day out in the sun, but thank you everybody. And Nate, thank you for putting up a really great FKT to break. Um, you know, that Eastern Shore crew over there, they're amazing. Uh, they, you know, on, on a drop came out to support, you know, one of the uh, out-of-towners. And then uh, my girlfriend, Erin, it was big thanks to her for driving me down, taking her time out. Uh, this was her first time crewing. So I think uh, I scared her away from ever doing that again, but we'll see. So hopefully she'll come back out again. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, great weekend and Hope everybody has a great weekend doing their trail runs, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, bye. So, Richard, thanks so much for that clip. Great job. Uh, his clip just came in this morning, so I didn't get a chance to uh, listen to it uh, and preface the clip, uh, but I am looking forward to listening to it, hopefully when I'm traveling this week as well. Uh, so, nice work, man. All right, so getting into results and voices uh, from the trail. Uh, we will go, uh, let's go state to state. Uh, Bimbler's Bluff 50K in Guilford, Connecticut. Uh, it's a course connecting a handful of forest preserves and used to promote access to woodland trails in Connecticut. Of 106 finishers, Ian Connell took the overall win in 421 with Ella Carr uh, over the women's field in 556. Uh, bumping up to New Hampshire, Joe English Twilight Challenge 6-hour in Amherst, hosted by the Amherst Land Trust and Freestyle Farm. Uh, the Twilight Chal Challenge uh, has runners covering a 2.6-mile loop solo or in teams up to 6 hours. Uh, of the six-hour uh, event, with 54 entrants, Julia Huffman took the win with 15 laps for somewhere around 35 miles. And Mark Nelson took the marathon win in 4.42, uh, with J.D. Lavalle in the half in 1.34. Uh, Acidotic Racing's Cranmore Mountain Race. Uh, I ranked uh, fifth toughest uh, 10K in Northeast on our feature article on uh, breaking up the distances and toughest trail races in the Northeast. Uh, check that out if you haven't already on the website. Uh, ran at Waterville, Waterville Valley on October 15th. I missed it last week. Uh, this is a New England gem. Uh, two loops totaling 6.2 miles with 2,400 feet of gain uh, set on a beautiful mountain. Uh, 129 finishers, Brandon Newbold uh, took the overall win in 49-43, edging second place Stephen Kerr by seven seconds. And Corey Dow was fourth overall and for the women, took the women's win in 53-46 with Cassandra Marin in second in 58-54. And then here to regale the day was women's winner, the wicked tough, Corey Dow. Hi, I'm Corey. I live up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, and I'm here today to talk about the Cranmore Mountain Race that went off a couple weekends ago. I was the winner on the female side of things, which was pretty exciting. Um, the Cranmore Mountain Race is special to me because it was my first ever mountain race a few years back when it was the U.S. Championship and it kind of is what got me hooked into the mountain running world and 
yeah, has just kept me going. Um, I'm really, I was really looking forward to it this year because I live right near Cranmore now and the race is in the fall and I love running in the fall because it's just, I can finally breathe. <laughs> uh, the nice fall weather, it's a nice, nice temperatures uh, and I, I'm not always, I don't know, my training's weird, but um, by the fall I'm usually feeling pretty good. Um, so yeah, I was really looking forward to it. My season up to up until Cranmore, it hasn't been anything like drastically different than doing a mixture of roads and mountains and yeah, just getting out there and running. So, um, but I did want to kind of see what I would be able to do this year. I was lucky to be able to help flag the course a few days beforehand because they needed, yeah, they needed some help with that. So I got to see a little sneak preview of some of the changes that we that were made to the course this year. Um, every year Acidotic likes to change it up a tiny bit, nothing too drastic, but uh, the Cranmore has a new mountain bike park now that they didn't have, yeah, that didn't exist last time the Cranmore mountain race went off, went off, so we were able to incorporate some of the new stuff from that, from that, and then keep some of the old stuff. Um, the course kind of goes so the Cranmore Mountain Race in general goes up and down the mountain twice, which is a little unique compared to some of the other mountain races that I've done where they just go up and down or like up and down a little and up and down. Um, Cranmore pretty much, it's kind of a straight shot up and then straight shot down and you do it again. Um, you go up, it's kind of gradual uphill start. Then you hook up to a, this year, we hooked up to a blue square ski trail uh, following like a maintenance road and then cut over and that hooked us up to the Black Diamond Kessler ski trail that's super steep at the top that gets people uh, power hiking if they hadn't been already and then you kind of cut down briefly and then go back up a hiking trail switch backy then you get to the top uh, I don't typically have time to take in time to take in the views during the race, but um, on my normal runs when I go up Cranmore, one of my favorite views is from that spot um, near the Meister Hut. Look out, super cool views. Um, so you pop up over that, cut across the mountain, and then you go down the other side through some of the mountain bike trails um, that Ride Noko's created. So it's pretty cool to get to make use of those as well and see the running in mountain biking community come together. Uh, you cut down those, then you hook back up to the ski trail and you kind of just blast down the ski trail. Uh, this year and in some past years, it was super muddy through that ski trail section. So a uh, good spot to, to watch if you want to see some epic falls and wipeouts. Um, I got a, I know that's where my dad likes to post up. <laughs> um, and then you, Another thing we incorporated this year is part of the new mountain bike, the Skills Park at Cranmore, and it was kind of like a switchback ending before you then took off back up the hill again, the mountain. Um, yeah, the race itself, uh, for me personally, I didn't feel as great as I was hoping to feel. Um, I mean, I was obviously happy with the outcome, but I would have liked to feel a little better, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, it was pretty cool. I got to have uh, the second place female, Cassandra Marin, was right up there with me at the top of the first climb. Um, and then I was able to cool down with her and the third place woman, so that was awesome to see. And then always like seeing some of the other, just being out there with such talented runners is always really cool. Um, the race, I think, went pretty smoothly. Uh, they so the funds went this year to the White Mountain Trail Collective, which is super cool, super awesome that we were able to make that connection. And then they also partnered with Saucony that helped provide some of the awards and funding for the race, which I hope they're able to maybe somehow continue to keep doing because I think that that can help build up the mountain running community. I know it is growing a ton already, but um, just being able to have that kind of support and yeah, just get the support out there for that. I think that'll be really cool. Um, 
yeah, it's always a fun race. I'm looking forward to it continuing to be in the fall. Um, the as far as has it the you know this has been a weird year with the pandemic. I think that they did a good job of making everybody feel comfortable um, and doing like a little thing, a little talk at the beginning and then just rolling with the race and keeping participants informed. Acidotic does a really good job about sending emails out, just updating participants on what's going on. And yeah, it's just really cool to see. Um, also always, always awesome to have like uh, Joe Vigor Photography was there. He always puts out really awesome photos and we get to see see him there and see like a local it just it just ties together a lot of different local aspects um giving back to the valley a little bit which is cool um trying to think of some other takeaways or anything yeah i guess yeah i'm just looking forward to the race next year um as far as my season goes i'm i think my last like bigger races are going to be this upcoming weekend. I've got the Great Bay 5K, which is a flat, fast course. I'm looking forward to that one um, on Saturday. And then the Seacoast Half Marathon is the next day. Uh, my Runner's Alley team kind of helps sponsor or do some do some work with those races. And so I I like to go and attend those. and. It also will be a change. It'll feel a lot faster <laughs> um, being, on, being on the flat service compared to running up here in the mountains. So I look forward to that. But yeah, always fun to be out there running and being a part of this mountain and just running community. So Corey, uh, nice job, and thanks for getting that clip back over. And Corey, another one with Ithaca Connections, uh, also ran for uh, Cornell. And uh, so it's cool to... Uh, still see the relatively small world out there. Uh, so great job. Uh, New York, uh, the maybe the first and maybe the last six hour went down uh, using a one-ish mile loop along the ponds ripe in fall foliage in Duran Eastman Park in Rochester, New York. This is an event put on by uh, the Trails Rock crew, a wonderful crew, uh, trail crew out of Rochester, uh, active in trail work, um, getting some people into the sport. Uh, as well as just putting on some uh, really nice events. So of 44 finishers, Ellie Pell came back out of out of the finished shadows uh, to nab the win with 32 miles uh, ahead of Pete Kresak. Uh, and here to give us a bit of maybe the last six hour flavor is overall and women's winner, Ellie Pell. Hey, Trails Collective, Ellie here with a little bit of a race recap from the Mafamidal six hour race that uh, I did on Saturday. Uh, Ian hasn't actually asked for this video yet, but I know it's coming and I might as well do it now while I'm thinking about it and have time. So it was a duel. Like, have you ever heard of the a book Duel in the Sun with like Alberto Salazar and some other guy? Well, it was like that between me and Pete Kresak this past weekend. You should have been there. So Pete, I rolled up to the start line, you know, about five minutes before the race starts and Pete gives me the eye and I knew he was coming after me. And then he said that I was trying to sabotage him by pushing all of his nutrition behind mine, which I did not touch his nutrition. So playing mental games, I get it. Well. Gun goes off and uh, Pete takes off like a rocket. And I was like, Amelia, we're gonna have just have to reel him in because Pete's got some legs today. And boy, did he. We, uh, we traded positions all day. You know, we were playing those mental sabotage games. You know, he uh, at one point tried to push me off the side of the cliff. Um, I tried to sabotage him by eating all of his nutrition. And, uh, you know, by the end, we were both struggling, crawling in. And uh, it, was, it was pretty tight towards the end. And you know what? We, we did that last loop and we both ended up with 32 loops for the Mafamidal six hour classic. And uh, so, you know, tying isn't the greatest. Like I still feel this fire to just throw down again with Pete Kresak, but um, 
you know, he, uh, he's got this like heart of steel. And I know that, you know, if, if we had four more hours, I would have dropped and he would have won, but thankfully it stopped at, a, at hour six. And, uh, with the last lap with a $20 promise from, uh, my friend Shay's boyfriend, Jake, I kicked it into high gear and I sprinted that last lap because, you know, I will do anything for 20 bucks anything and um and also you know pete he had some fire at the end because he he uh is turning i think 39 on tuesday of this week so a couple days ago so everybody say happy birthday to pete but nobody i am oh shit i am coming back for you i'm coming back for you so great job ellie and thank you for that clip and Ellie also has started, uh, for those of you who are uh, in with us from the beginning, as we started, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago or so, uh, Ellie was, it was the initial uh, plan for an Ellie and I to be doing some of these rundowns together. And then she shifted gears, went back to school, and uh, just her, uh, what she was able to do just changed. Uh, but she was able to, she was coaching this past fall, volleyball, uh, but she uh, was able to start um creating some podcasts as opposed to just the YouTube episodes out of these uh, episodes each week. So for those who uh, haven't found it, uh, this will be available in just audio format as well. So a big shout out not only to Ellie for taking the win this past weekend, uh, but to your continued assistance and support of the Trails Collective. The Clark Six Hour Classic put on by Salt City Sports went down at the Clark Reservation in Jamesville, uh, not too far from uh, maybe the first, maybe the last. I think they're going to have to space out their events, both being six hour uh uh, timed events, I think within maybe an hour or so of each other. Uh, but uh, Clark Six Hour uses a 1.7 mile mixed surface loop. Uh, they had 52 finishers for their third running with Patrick Hallahan followed by Thomas Joslin uh, emerging on top for the men with 37.4 miles and Rhonda Bullard third overall and first women's finisher with 35.7. Uh, Rhonda's finish established a new women's course record, surpassing her own mark from 2019 by 1.7 miles. Uh, so nice work, Rhonda. In Pennsylvania, uh, Call of the Wilds Mountain Fest 50K and 25K went down in Waterville, PA. Uh, of 187 finishers, Ben Robinson had another solid day on the trails, uh, crushing the prior 50K course record for the win in 428. Uh, with a course that, which offers over 9,000 feet of elevation gain, and some technical terrain that is absolutely flying. Uh, Call of the Wilds uh, 50K comes up as second in my ranking of uh, Northeast 50K events uh, by toughness. Um, and the, so definitely a burly course. And again, that time is flying out there. Uh, 50K women's win went to Karen Dunn in 601, also a solid time. Uh, in the 25K, which I ranked third uh, toughest 25K in the Northeast, of 134 finishers, Joe Nardo took the win in 244 with a women's win to Lisa Fisher in 304. And then here to take us in uh, deeper and give us a rundown <clears throat> from their vantage points of Call of the Wild and their days out there, uh, both Ben Robinson and Karen Dunn. Uh, so Ben and Karen, take it away. Hey everyone, um, my name is Ben Robinson. I'm a trail runner from Tunkhannock, Pennsylvania. Um, and I run for Hoka and Ultra Spire. Um, this year has gone pretty well so far. Um, uh, before Call of the Wilds this past weekend, I've uh, been able to pace out at uh, Hoka's Project Carbon X2. Um, I was able to thankfully win Heiner um, uh, in the spring. And then uh, I was able to go out and pace my friend Hayden Hawks at Western States. Um, Right after that, I was able to go to uh, Spain to run at the Sky Running World Championships. Um, and right before Call of the Wilds, um, I placed second at the USATF uh, Trail Running Championships. Um, so this year has been really well, and Call of the Wilds was kind of just a um, end of the year, uh, see where fitness is before uh, my next big event. and. I've always really liked the idea of Call of the Wilds 50K because um, <clears throat> I did the 25K twice um, a couple years back and um, it was always fun racing Matt Lipsy and and uh, and just uh, the course and the area is my favorite part of Pennsylvania. So 
Um, I just love going out there this time of year. Um, and um, so I had a little bit of experience on parts of the course um, by doing the 25K. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, I loved racing Matt. He would, he and I uh, always went back and forth and uh, I... I beat him the first time and he beat me the second time on the course. So we'll have to have a third time, uh, to see, to, to see who gets that third, that second win. Um, but the 50 K is really cool. I think that it's probably the most challenging, uh, trail 50 K in Pennsylvania. Um, since it's a 50 K with about 8,000 feet gain, elevation gain. And, uh, the trails are really, um, in some spots really technical um uh and even the first hour hour and a half is in the dark um which was really new for me um i did a training run about two weeks ago um in the dark just to test it out and um that part was really new to me so i i wasn't sure how that part was gonna go um but i think it went pretty well um once you got used to it it, it was kind of really fun to run around in the woods uh, in the dark, uh, but the first, like, 20 minutes, I was, well, the first 20 minutes is uphill anyways, but, um, I wasn't fully adjusted to it, um, but my expectations leading into the race this pack, past weekend, um, I wasn't really expecting much, um, I, uh, am kind of in a base building s stage right now, um, I've just been focused on speed work a lot the last month, month and a half. Um, since this is an early part of my 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 cycle, um, so um, we haven't really been doing much hills like hill training or hill workouts yet. Um, so we just kind of wanted to see where we were at, and I just was really excited to run the 50k. Um, and like a uh, last week the week like right before the race um i twisted both of my ankles on a on a tra uh, a trail run and the one ankle is real it was really bad so um all week i was testing how to tape my ankle um um so every day i would try a new new system and um thankfully none of them worked until literally race day um, so that one worked and I was able to, uh, thankfully not totally destroy my ankle, but, um, uh, there were a couple sections, um, especially in the dark where, um, I was just really taking it easy, especially on some of the downhill sections. Um, I really had to take it easy, um, to not really, um, uh, I didn't want to hurt and re-injure myself. Um, and which might have been a blessing in disguise because I didn't take the downhills very hard so I was really able to um, open up on the flatter sections and uphill sections because um, the course is really four major large climbs and then a bunch of little ones um, not little ones four major climbs and then a, a bunch of uh, other really good climbs as well um, so uh, the big, the big climb at mile 26, Tolbert, um, like I said, thankfully I didn't crush the downhill, so, uh, that one I didn't even have to hike at all, I was thankfully able to run right up that one, um, so I was really excited about that, uh, it is a later in the race, and it was such a, it's such a, like, grueling hill, so I was really excited to not have to, uh, walk up that one at all, um, I didn't really have any lows, uh, during the race, um, about two months ago, my coach and I, uh, sat down and talked about a new fueling strategy, um, and that really paid off this race, and it did as well in my last race, um, at the 50k championships, um, so, uh, it's been, it's really helped, and I'm really excited that I finally feel like I'm getting better at the longer distances, uh, the 50k is really uh, one of my favorite distances, um, but yeah, I just really felt strong on. Since I said I was in a speed section, uh, a speed block, the flat sections I was really able to go pick it up. Um, so I feel like I made up a lot of time on those sections. 
Um, and like I said, right before the race, uh, I twisted my ankle. So the day before, my coach and I were even like, like maybe we shouldn't run. Maybe we should just like rest up. Uh, but I'm like, no, let's just let's just run. Let's just hop in. And if if I'm not feeling it or my ankle hurts, I'll just stop. Um, and I'm really thankful that he didn't that we didn't talk myself out of not running it the next day. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really cool experience. Um, Craig always does a really great job, and uh, he always always has the coolest prizes. Uh, this was the prize this time. He got a, a custom Woodsman's Pal, and then they, they engraved it there for us as well. Um, so he always has the coolest. He said that this is what they used to clear trails with, or maybe they still clear the trails with. Um, but as for the rest of the year, um, I'm just going to get a good training cycle in. And um, my next big race is uh, Bandera 100K in January in Texas. Um, the goal is to get a golden ticket for Western States next year. So um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm really excited. And uh, congrats to everybody this weekend. You did really well. Um, and hopefully we'll see you out there again soon. See ya. Hi, my name is Karen Dunn. Uh, I had just completed the Call of the Wilds 50K race this past Sunday in Waterville, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's put on by race director uh, Craig Fleming and of course his, his crew, his group that supports him and, and backs him up by really helping him to clear those trails and really get him in nice shape for the races. Um, I say races because Call of the Wild, it's a mountain fest. Uh, there's, I believe, three races. So it's a 50K, 25K, and then I think the day before is a kids race as well. Obviously shorter. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> he always puts on nice events. I've done several of his races, but I have to say this is my favorite. I love the course, um, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. So just to give you a little bit of background on me, um, I'm... I've mostly been a marathoner, although I've been doing a lot more trail races probably in the last two years, so I guess I'm not new to the trail running scene anymore. In fact, um, I want to continue to do it, so I guess I can call myself a trail runner now. Um, <clears throat> but I still like to train for the marathons. I like the, a nice fall or spring marathon. So leading up to this race, I had done marathon training primarily over the summer. Um, it went fairly well, not as perfect as I would have liked it to have gone, you know, a few days missed here or there for family obligations, but other than that, it, it went fairly well, uh, and so, you know, not being one of my best training cycles, um, going into my fall marathon, which was wine glass in October, I had an A, B, and C goal. Um, I think my A goal was a little outlandish, but um, it was to beat the course record, which is two. It was two fifty thirty three, and I've run well below that um, a number of times. So I thought, well, why not? You know, we'll put that as an A goal. B goal is to um, try for a two fifty two, and C goal is you know, get close to that and just try to place well. So I hit my seagull. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I came in through the finish line at 254 and some change. I uh, ended up third overall. Um, the top three were all masters that day. So, of course, the first masters took my A goal, the course record, which uh, obviously I wasn't running for that that day anyway. Um, so it was a pretty successful day. And I feel like that actually set me up nicely for my win at um, the 50K this past Sunday. So, you know, really getting in some threshold pace miles over the summer and running a pretty decent marathon um, about four weeks before this race on Sunday, which I don't normally recommend as a coach doing anything like that. But, um, you know, it was really just kind of for fun. But so coming into the 50K, just to give you a little bit about it, um, the first mile, I think it took me about 18 minutes. That's a massive climb, just climb, climb, climb. And, you know, it's 
kind of like when's it going to stop here and it's not it's in the dark so everyone has their headlights on you look up just to see where the headlights end and they look like stars at that point so you're you're really not sure how much more climbing you have to go but um <clears throat> there's a nice downhill obviously to reward you at the end of any massive uphills like that but the course is great um you know there's really i would say four pretty massive climbs and other climbs within there but four that are memorable <laughs> although you probably want to forget them um but no it's great it makes the course dynamic um it takes you through forests it takes you across little creek crossings uh, it's pretty technical in terms of the rocks and such, but then there's other portions that are extremely runnable, which for me, I like that kind of course. I don't like very technical that I can't run it. So this was good in that there were a lot of portions of the race where I could really open up and, and um, get my stride on. So uh, I made sure to fuel well throughout the race uh, because I wasn't sure going into it how how well I do actually after doing a marathon so close to this race. Uh, but I surprised myself. I felt really good. The legs felt great. Um, <clears throat> there were moments where they felt tired and I just took another gel and, you know, some more tailwind and, you know, then the, that kicks in and you feel good again. So just made sure to continue the fueling. But the course is awesome. And again, Craig has a great crew behind him that really cleans those trails up. And especially after the big storm Ida that had come through, I think there were a lot of trees down. I saw a lot of sawdust on the trail and it reminded me of Craig and his crew um, while I was out there. Um, and one thing that's really interesting, uh, you know, I... I think it's funny what people think about when they're out there running races like these and you know I had thought about a few things that are near and dear and close to heart and you know that's part of the reason why I love running it just helps you kind of process things and um, <clears throat> not only that but just you know the health and the strength that comes with it but also <laughs> uniquely in this race I thought for about six hours about the finisher award <laughs> and I know Craig only gives to the overall um, finishers so you'll see here um, first overall female finisher um, for the Call of the Wilds but this is called a Woodman's Pal um, you have to be careful with it it is very sharp <laughs> took me a few times to learn how to get it out of here but uh, I'll show you it has basically a knob on the top here for cutting off branches it's a like a trail um, land maintenance tool used for clearing trails and the reason they give this out as the award is because the gentleman who created the trails that we ran on used a tool like this back in the day when he created the trails his name was John Weber and so very uniquely they got a hold of um, some of these to give out as the awards which I love it <laughs> so maybe it's their way of recruiting me to help them clean the trails next year I don't know maybe I'll make my own trails in this area we'll have to see that's part two so anyway this is used for clearing tree branches and then this part here is your machete for bushwhacking basically so but yeah very interesting and and on the blade it says Woodman's Pal too, 1941 so um, very unique great race awesome people Craig always has a fire going before and after the race to stay warm in the colder months and um, <clears throat> you know his food and drink for for people afterwards it's really a great event that he puts on um, all of them but in this case it was called Wilds Mountain Fest so um, yeah great race and I, I would recommend it the views along the way are incredible and I think it's just a great way to to see those sites um, in our own state here in Pennsylvania so that's another reason I I love those races all right thanks guys oh next up so next race is JFK 50 miler so we're progressing from marathon to 50k to then 50 miler in another four weeks so we'll see uh you know if this was a good tune-up for that one in four weeks all right 
Thanks, guys. Happy running. And great job to uh, both Ben and uh, Karen. Again, that is flying times on one of the burlier courses in the Northeast. Uh, and thanks so much for getting those clips in. So great job. Uh, in Rhode Island, survival of the fittest 24-hour trail ultra in Cumberland, uh, Rhode Island went down. Um, it, I was a little, I, I think this is a um, OCR uh, type format. They put on a, a bunch of events, which looks like it's in a <clears throat> kind of a closed course, uh, maybe format uh, in terms of on their property where they had, looks like they have like OCR set up. Um, I wasn't able to dig too much into that format, uh, but it looks like it's pretty fun and a cool scene. Uh, in Virginia, the Piedmont 8-hour run uses a 2.6-mile field and forest loop in Powhatan, uh, Virginia. I may have pronounced that wrong. Uh, Trey uh, Windwahane uh, covered the most ground with 48 miles out of, 40, out of 50 finishers, with the highest grossing female on the day at 41.1 miles, achieved by Lillian Thomas, Rhonda Maxwell, and Marcella Luna. Uh, and here to cue us into the Piedmont 8-hour and her first time of several finishes cresting 40 miles, Marcella Luna. Hey y'all, my name is Marcella Luna and I'm coming to you from Midlothian, Virginia and I am here to talk to you about the Piedmont 8 Hour. Piedmont 8 Hour is an 8 hour run that's held yearly at um, Powhatan State Park in Powhatan, Virginia. This year the course involved running 3.4-ish mile loops, as many as you can within an 8 hour period, I like to say getting it done in a day's work with this event. Um, this was my fifth year of running the event and this has quickly become my favorite event to run every year. One, it's very easy for me to get to the park. It's less than a half an hour away from my house. Two, the, um, the course is completely runnable. And what I mean by runnable is the trails in Powhatan State Park are very well maintained. The trail is gentle, rolling hills, and it's beautiful. You find yourself weaving in and out of periods on the course where you are on um, wooded trails and periods where you are going through open fields, and it is just beautiful. Another thing that I love about this event so much is I have to give a big shout out to the race directors. Um, they are a race group, Virginia Adventures, Dan Polskamp and his wife, Luz. They are beyond encouraging of all the runners out there. When you um, go there, within a couple of laps, they will know you by name. And that friendly atmosphere rubs off on all the runners out there that day. There's not a competitive atmosphere. Everyone is out there with their own goals, but everyone is so super encouraging of one another. I'm an introvert. This is not comfortable for me to do this video today, but one thing that's kind of become a running joke with me running this race, especially in my fifth year, is that this introvert always picks up a friend at the event. And this is true. Every year I pick up someone that becomes a very fast friend and someone that I have on occasion gone and traveled to other races with. So I, I love this so much about the race. Well, this was my fifth year running it, and Last four years, I've always fallen one lap shy of hitting that 40 mile mark. And secretly in my mind, I'm not a very competitive runner, I've said, you know, it would be nice for one year for me to hit that 40 mile mark. And I always miss it. This year I said, I'm not going to go in with any expectations. If I hit a 50K, I will be happy. And within three laps, I'm like, you know what, if I get a 50K, I'll be great. And then, with about an hour and a half left in the race, um, Dan, the race director, his wife, Luz, are like, you know, you know what? You are going to hit 40 miles. Just two more laps and you got this. And I'm like, I don't think I can do it. And they crunch that runner math and they like, absolutely, you're going to hit 40 this year. Um, Whitney Richmond was out there um, this year too and she said, work for another hour and a half and then you can rest. And I have to say, with their encouragement and their support, this year I was successful in meeting that elusive goal of 40 miles. I have to say, one of the best things about the race this year, too, was um, my sister, who is not an ultra runner. She won't say that. I keep telling her she can be. 
She decided to come out um, and run this race. She came down from central New York. This was her second time running the race. This is Rhonda Maxwell. Um, she, a couple of years ago, ran Piedmont, and she placed first. And this year, she um, successfully ran it again, and she had a second place finish. And um, I am looking forward in the coming year that I have encouraged my sister Rhonda to um, do more ultras. We'll be traveling to South Carolina for another um, 50K. And um, we'll also be using that as an opportunity to pace people that are doing the 30-hour um, run. And then we're also going to be traveling to Utah this year to be running a 50K out in Zion. And I am looking forward this year to doing my next 100 miler, which that was a huge accomplishment for the, me this past year, where I ran the CGG 100 and completed my first 100 miler. And I'm looking forward to doing that again. So overall, it was a successful running year that was a highlight of me being able to finally accomplish that 40 miles at the Piedmont 8 hour. Again, I'm not going to put any pressure on myself next year for doing it, but I most certainly will be out there again. I have to thank Dan and Lou's Pull Scamp for their encouragement. They actually presented me with an award this year for hitting um, five years of running one of their races, and they have guaranteed a um, that I will be running more of their adventures. And I encourage anyone to go and check them out. Virginia Adventures, it's a great company and um, with, with great race directors and great volunteers. You can never forget the volunteers at these races. And Ian, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this. Hopefully someday on my race calendar, I will have some adventures up in New York. Looking forward to it. Bye. All right, and one outside of the uh, typical trail realm uh, is highlighting an individual we've had on several episodes uh, over the past year a most excellent uh, trail and ultra runner out of our region. Uh, she was able to qualify to represent Team USA uh, on the, or for the uh, International Beer Mile uh, competition over in, I think it was Manchester, uh, UK. Uh, so uh, Casey Marin, um, nice work, way to represent. And we are going to weave in a clip from her, uh, giving us the rundown on how, how all that went. Hey, what's up? My name's Cassandra. I go by Casey. I'm a mountain ultra trail runner here in New Hampshire. Run a lot of like local races in New England. Um, but this past weekend was a little bit different. Um, last year, I ran a virtual beer mile and it was fast enough to qualify for uh, Team USA. So I was flown over to Manchester, England and yeah this weekend i competed in the beer mile world classic um so that is where a whole bunch of teams from different countries get together and have a good time um and and see who who can put together the fastest team um i saw a world record go down by corey belmore that was really cool um and i got to chug and run with the best of them um, I brought over my own my own beer um, just because I'm familiar with drinking Bud Platinum. Uh, basically, for anyone who doesn't know, Beer Mile is you chug a beer, you run a quarter mile lap. Um, you do that four times, so you wind up drinking four beers and running four laps for a mile. You do that as fast as possible, um, and that's that's your overall time. Your goal here is you need to get all your beer down um, and they measure how much is left over in the bottles or cans after the race. And if you have more than four ounces left for the total of, you know, the four, four bottles, that's a DQ and you don't want to be disqualified. Um, your beer has to be at least 12 ounces and 5% ABV. You can puke, but if you puke, you have to run another another lap, a penalty lap. Um, so I was flown over to, to Manchester um, on Thursday afternoon. I got there Friday morning. I roomed with Allie, Allison Morgan. She's a former like, Team USA mountain runner. Super cool. Met a whole bunch of like Team USA women. We're from all over the place. Um, so I kind of just followed her lead. For the race itself, it was Saturday afternoon. 
Um, I had brought my beard with me. They're twist off. There's like, there's all these different things you got to consider for a beer mile. Um, the beer they were providing wasn't twist off. So had I not brought those, I would have had to run with a bottle opener. Um, but it went better than I had expected. My previous PR is 750 and over the weekend I ran a 710 and I just tried to chase um, Allie and Polly Keene from England. She, she actually broke, um, she had a country record for herself. Uh, so I just kind of followed their lead um, and like first couple laps I stayed, try to keep them in sight. Um, my fastest chug was about 14 seconds and that includes like grabbing the beer, opening it, chugging it down and then like crossing over the next timing mat to start your running lap. Um, and my slowest one was about 34 seconds, but all of my running um, was pretty quick. I think my last lap was an 81 and super happy to come away with the bronze medal, uh, third place in the world for the beer mile. It's never something that I thought I'd get travel funding for, but um, a bunch of fun. The way how I got into it, um, last year during COVID on Mother's Day, I got together uh, some neighborhood women and, and, you know, our husbands watched the kids. We ran a beer mile together and like that's kind of where I discovered I was decent at it. Um, to be a good beer miler, you don't have to be like a pro runner. You don't have to be a pro drinker, although Sweden, Scotland, um, holy shit, they are fucking animals when it comes to competitive drinking. Um, but if you're, if you're like moderately decent at running and moderately decent at chugging and you can run with a full stomach, then you're going to do pretty well at a beer mile. Um, but yeah, overall it was it was pretty awesome. You can check out more footage and see see some pretty funny clips of you know folks puking and it was just a good time on beermile.com. Um, and if you ever get a chance to to run a beer mile, highly recommend it. It's like taking all of the pain and discomfort of an ultra and compressing it into less than 10 minutes. So if you want to hate yourself for a little bit and then feel pretty happy afterwards, um, definitely give it a go. Next for me, I think I'm doing a 50 mile ruck in November in Washington, DC, and that's the World Rucking Championships. I seem to like these obscure titles, so we'll see how that goes. See you around. All right, so events coming this weekend in the Northeast Trail Running World. October 30th, we have the Topsco Valley 50K in Baltimore, Maryland. The Mount Tammany 10 40 mile in the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, Horseshoe Bend Boogie 50K 50 mile in Frenchtown, uh, New Jersey. Summit 50K 50 mile in Salamanca, New York. And the Castle River Run 50K in Garrison, New York. Um, some really beautiful courses in there. Uh, Patapsco Valley I ran, really enjoyed, wonderful resource uh, outside of Baltimore. Mount Tammany 10 is one of the burliest in our region in terms of elevation gain. Uh, slightly different course uh, this year, I think based on mostly on fires from a couple of years ago. And they were, we were coveted last year. I was slated to run last year, rolled over to this year. Uh, but now that I'm coaching, we have a race same day. So I can't make it this year, unfortunately. And then the Summit 50K 50 mile, I have not been uh, um, over some of the parts of the course, but I know it to be a really uh, beautiful area. And I think this is a first year inaugural event. And Castle River Run 50K, I have run. Um, had a pretty much a good day out there winning that a couple years ago. Um, got a little bit ugly in the final miles, but it was definitely a, a course that I felt like flowed. Uh, so, and then October 31st, uh, Tussie Mountainback 50 Mile in Bowlesburg, PA, a classic event, which is, I think, sometimes or in prior years served as the USATF Championship, and the Virginia Spartan Trail 50K in Arrington, Virginia. Uh, so those are what's on deck, and uh, that's what I got for you this week. Uh, so again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for liking the station. Thanks for plugging it. Thanks to all those uh, who have submitted clips or updates uh, as we've gone. If you've got ideas for articles you'd like uh, to see me work on for the Trails Collective in terms of topic areas, uh, let me know and maybe I can work on those if I take some time away from the uh, weekly rundowns over the winter to focus on some articles. And um, I will check those out. All right, so until next week, I hope you all have a beautiful weekend ahead. 
If you've got kids and you're taking them out uh, trick-or-treating, hopefully it is a wicked cute weekend. And uh, I will talk to you next week. Till that time, see ya!